At uh, 836, let's bring in financial Phil. Phil McCoy from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad's Group of Financial Advisors on Winchester Avenue in Martinsburg. Good morning, Philly. Good morning, guys. How are you all? Great. Great to have you with us, Phil. Uh, NFL training camps are open. Uh, the Steelers uh, keep adding to the team. They signed another linebacker late uh, over the weekend here, Phil, building up that defense more. What do you think? What's the record? Give me a record. Give me a prediction. You want a record from me? Let's go with uh, let's go twelve and five. I think they're they're going to surprise a lot of people this year, especially offensively. The the key component with their offense is that offensive line. They went out and they got some horses, and their offensive line got much much better last year, which coincided with that little run that they had. Najee Harris had played a lot better. Kenny Pickett played a lot better. We know that defense is without injuries. That defense is going to be nasty, as it always is. Man, I'm hearing a lot of good things about those two corners that they had drafted, Joey Porter Jr. and Corey Trice. I'm hearing a lot of good things about them. But we have to keep in mind that to this point, they're just practicing in pajamas, as Mike Tomlin would say. So that could change when the pads come on. Football and shorts. Uh, Mike Height, who I mentioned in the previous segment, uh, his brothers, he said both were paratroopers in the 82nd. By the way, he's a Cowboys fan. What kind of year do you think the Cowboys are going to have this year? Oh, God, does it matter? We're going to talk about them nonstop <laughs> anyway, whether they're 5-12 and 12 or 12-5. 12 and 5. I would admit, though, we have a client that's a huge Cowboys fan, huge Cowboys fan. So we try not to bring it up during the course of a meeting because it could make the meeting go on and on. <laughs> but what I didn't realize last year, up until like the day before, Dallas was 12-5 and 5 last year. And I'm thinking, how? How in the world were they 12-5? and 5? But you don't know. You can't give them credit for good years because they talk about them so much. It's like the, the Cowboys and the Lakers. And I've got nothing against it. I really don't. I don't have anything against the Cowboys. But the, the Ravens, on the other hand, and the Commanders or whatever their names are now, the team, um, which, by the way, that whole Dan Snyder song thing kind of broke my heart. That, that did break my heart. I have been a long I want to say hater, but I've always, as Colin knows, I've always made fun of the, the Washington football team commanders, whatever they are. Uh, I've always made fun of them. But part of that group that purchased them is my favorite athlete of all time, Magic Johnson. So I'm kind of I'm, I'm mixed. I don't know what to do. I don't, I don't know if I can continue to make fun of them or I have to have a soft spot because Magic Johnson's part of that owner's group. I don't know. I don't know. It's a sad time for me. It's a sad time. Well, you can get your Magic Johnson fix on that Showtime show that HBO does, which is the story of watched, the Lakers from that era. Yeah, I did. I watched it, and uh, they they all said it was very inaccurate, but it did take me back to you know my kind of my my childhood. There was one reason that my father would let me set up late, and he would set up late. And there was one and all, the, the only reason was to watch the Lakers play. So during basketball season, I was sleepy during the school day a lot because me and dad would sit up and I don't care if it was in the middle of the season we would sit up and watch the Lakers and they they were they played one game back then on on that was televised and it was always the Lakers and we would sit up and watch that game no matter what it didn't matter what was going on uh, that was the only legitimate excuse to stay up late that show has done such an amazing job of casting people who have a pretty good resemblance to the guy they're I playing agree. yes Especially Michael Cooper. Oh, my See goodness. Cooper. That's like a I clone. Thought him. I thought it was his son or something. <laughs> Holy Moses. That looked like a clone. Yeah. And the, the guy, the Michael Cooper guy is from around Baltimore. And uh, some friends of ours, daughters, uh, they dated him in college. And I guess he was like in a major in some kind of finance thing or other. And it was kind of getting set up in that direction. And then just gave it up at the end because he wanted to pursue his acting career. And uh, our, our friend uh, Soraya is her name, and her daughter's name is uh, Dana, and she's the one that dated him. And I guess when he decided he wanted to go and pursue acting, it was, all right, you know, I need a more career-driven guy. And out he went. And now the next thing you know, he shows up on TV in this program, and he's just like dead on Michael well, Cooper. My goodness. In his, in his defense, I don't know what other role he can play. Because he is a spitting image of Michael <laughs> Cooper. So I hope that, sh that sh show keeps on going and going. Because he may be unemployed after the show spin. <laughs> hey, he's, he's pretty good, man. Uh, let's talk money. And let's talk about the month of July. This is the final trading day in July. And to this point, Phil, it has been a pretty good month for all the major indices. It's been, it has been a pretty good month. And you had to convince me of that this morning before I went on at 630. 
But in comparison to the rest of the year, it has slowed down a little bit. But it was still a really good month, man. I mean, to be up 3% on all three indices, even the Dow, which has trailed greatly the S&P and NASDAQ so far this year. But at the end of the day, it has been a really good month. And that has been the kind of the story, same story from the beginning of the year, really since October of last year. As inflation had started to come down, the Federal Reserve has slowed and our markets have reacted in a positive way. What has transpired that really boosted it, one of the boosts so far this year, is that th- this whole idea of a soft landing, or at least it's going to be a, any recession would be pushed out further in the future because of strong jobs numbers. And we, we, we traded what we thought about strong employment numbers. At one point, that would make our markets fall because really that's an inflationary pressure uh, but that has continued to be the case while inflation continues to drop. So a lot of analysts and experts, are, it, it has kind of boosted that case for a for a soft landing and or at least pushed it out further and further. So that's why our markets have reacted so positively this year to the pace of inflation, what the Federal Reserve has done or not done, and uh, this whole idea of a recession and when, if and when it may happen. What are we watching for this week, Phil? Uh, this week, I think the biggest movers is going to be Apple and Amazon. You know, it's still a heavy earnings week, and that gets caught. Earnings get caught up in the weeds, but John likes to say, and he's completely right that uh, the stock market will follow company early earnings. And he pauses a few seconds and says, "Eventually," and that is correct. And this week, Apple and Amazon. There's many more companies that are going to report, but Apple and Amazon will be those headline companies, and we get job numbers again. You know, so throughout the week. Uh, I think Apple and Amazon's Thursday, I think, and the uh, jobless claims is on Friday. But throughout the week, we'll get little nuggets of some companies that are reporting that may be an indicator for Apple and Amazon as well. Uber, and uh, you know, my, my fascination with Uber and Lyft, uh, they're reporting this week, so I want to pay attention to that. Pfizer, Moderna, uh, Starbucks, and Starbucks is one that it, it really doesn't move the markets, but for me, it tells me how comfortable the consumer is because there's, you know, I don't want to say you're wasting your money at Starbucks, but if you don't feel confident in your own situation, you're not going to buy coffee for 6 or $7 and let half of it sit there. So I've always thought that Starbucks is a good company to look at to measure how the consumer actually, how comfortable they actually feel. So a lot of information this week, maybe not as heavy as last week, but it is still a very busy week, especially on the earnings front. Yeah. Good morning, Phil. Uh, through the years, there's been several investment opportunities, such as our, the Roth, and the like. Uh, is there something coming down the uh, uh, the pike that will be kind of re, uh, be a, 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 another approach to the deferred investment? Oh, absolutely. And then you know we talked about this a lot last year in hopes that it would pass and have this Secure Act 2.0, and it's called 2.0 because it was an original Secure Act of 2019 that kind of changed their required distributions. And those of you that have started required distributions, you know, sometimes it's a sore subject because you may not want that money, but the government makes you take it out. So the Secure Act, the original Secure Act kind of pushed that out a little bit, but they changed some inherited IRA rules and inherited account rules for children and people 10 years or more in difference in age when they inherit accounts. Well, this Secure Act 2.0 had so many things in it as a financial planner, and this passed in December of 2022. It had so many things in it. As a financial planner, I thought, yes, man, this is great. And I could sit here all day and talk about some of these enhancements to retirement plans. But I was somewhat nervous because I, I wanted to see what's the give back. You know, the first Secure Act to give back was we're changing the inherited rules. You can't stretch those out if you ever heard the term a stretch IRA. And that was typically for children that had inherited IRAs, and they could stretch out those required distributions. Well, they kind of cut that off and and shrunk it to 10 years. And that was the give back for the first SECURE Act. For this SECURE Act, man, I really can't see a give back. I don't know what the downside is. Now, I could – what we're referring to it as is the Rothification of employee, employee retirement plans and a few things that we like to point out to people. One is 529 plan. So anyone that has children and has a 529 plan, if there's money remaining in that 529 plan or they don't use it, 
that can be rolled over to a Roth IRA. Now, there's stipulations. Of course, it, it can exceed what the annual contribution is. And the, there, at, currently, there's a max of 35000 And that plan has had to have been open for 15 years. But still, it makes us feel a little bit more comfortable about starting a 529 plan for our children in the event that they don't use it. You're not going to get penalized and taxed. Uh, the second part, and I, th- I think this is the most major part, as, as we all know, if you have an ERISA or a workplace retirement plan and there's that company match, everybody talks about what's that company match, 2 3 4 5% in the past and still currently today. But in the past and today, those company matches must go to tax deferred. And so you, you don't see it on your tax return. However, you deal with that devil in form of required distributions or when you pull money out later on in life, and we've, we've long talked about this, you get the deferral on the initial deposit, but then hopefully that money grows and grows and grows and grows, and then it is all subject to taxes, every penny of it, and which is why we're such big fans of Roth accounts. Well, now the employer has the ability to say, Mr. or Mrs. Employee, with the, when we put these matching contributions in for you, you can choose whether it's going to be tax deferred or go to the raw side. Now, the, if it goes to the raw side, you're going to see that in the form of imputed income on your tax return. So if you made 100000 and your employer put 5% of that inside the Roth 401k or whatever it may be, whatever IRS tag is on it, TSP or whatever, now your income for that year is going to be 105. But that's it. You're never going to have to worry about paying taxes on that again unless you pull it too soon and and then of course there's fifo rules with uh, how you pull money out out of roth uh, you know and one hot topic that they addressed in secure act 2.0 is student loan repayments you know where whether or not we should be paying people's student loans back for them and of course that didn't pass and and, and it's, it's still a hot topic but inside of secure act 2.0 employers have the ability to say hey we'll match your student loan payments with an IR, with a 401k contribution. So that was one thing that, you know, often young people would say, well, I can't save for retirement because i got to deal with these student loans, or I'm not going to pay my student loans because I'm, I want to save for retirement. And it was kind of a, a catch-22 for those people. Well, now what Secure Act 2.0 has said is, look, if you're making uh, payments into your student loans, you don't have to make payment there are contributions here at work. We can use that as your match. So I thought that was a, uh, a huge benefit to those people that were in that. But at the end of the day, you know, you also have, and this is where the Rothification comes in, and, and a lot of people ask, like, well, why does the government want to force dollars or encourage dollars into Roth, and that's really simple, and that is because they need income. You know, they so they need that income. Now those dollars will be taxed, and we're as financial planners in most cases, we're all for it. Put it in Roth if you can, and go ahead and deal with that tax devil right now, so you don't have to deal with it later on. Another part, and this would be the give back. And, and for me, sitting here in, in what we do in our profession, for me, this isn't a give back. But here's the give back for some of these. And it's far too extensive to go over with, with the time frame that we have. But the give back, I think anyway, what they're viewing as the give back is if you're over the age of 50, you have now and you always have had the ability to make catch-up contributions inside of your workplace retirement plan. And this year it's seven thousand five hundred. So the max that you can put in for yourself is twenty two thousand five hundred. Anyone under the age of fifty, if you can afford that, whether you have a Roth option or not, you can do twenty two five total from your paycheck, just defer it into your four oh one K or workplace retirement plan. And the catch up contribution is seven thousand five hundred. So the give back under Secure Act two point they said, Hey, if you're over the age of fifty and your income exceeds 145000 and you're making catch-up contributions, you no longer have a choice. Those cannot be tax-deferred. They must be taxed now, meaning it has to go into Roth. Well, that goes a little bit deeper because if that is the case, and we've long been proponents of having the Roth option in people's workplace retirement plan, well, if that is the case, that is to say 
that everyone, every plant is going to have to have a Roth option. Now, right now, most do, and it's becoming more and more popular, but that's going to just say, look, it was a sweeping change. Every plant is going to have to have a Roth option if you have someone over the age of 50, right? Because if they're going to make catch-up contributions and they have to go to the Roth side, uh, then therefore that option is going to have to be available. So, so many things that have they have encouraged to go to, and we've been encouraging this for years anyway, they're encouraging more monies onto the Roth side of, of the equation and the give back, I guess you would say, for this bill. And this, by the way, had bipartisan support. I don't think anyone opposed this. But the give back would be those those over the age of 50 that are making catch-up contributions. And I'm going to add one more point to this because last week we were talking about Social Security and the need for something to change. And for me, anyway, this bill is an underlier to what may be coming in the future. At age 61, 62, and 63 under Secure Act 2.0, that catch-up contribution is now enhanced. You can do more than the typical, you do 150% of whatever that catch-up contribution is. So because of that 60, 60 through age 63, where's that early retirement age for Social Security right now? It's at age 62. So I think they're trying to encourage people. to. If you feel confident enough to where you can retire, well, maybe if you can hang on just a few more years. Now you can put much more money aside in those final years. So I think that's an encouragement for people to work past the early retirement age. And another part, beginning in 2033, if you haven't obtained required distribution age yet, which it's now 73 under the new uh, Secure Act 2.0, it then extends out to age 75. So if you haven't hit 73 by 2033, your required distribution age is 75. So they pushed out out even further. The reason I think this may be an underlier to Social Security is I've always thought like maybe that early retirement age gets pushed from 62 to 65. And if that's the case, then your full retirement age, is it possible that that get pushed to age 70? That full retirement age would mean, would mean you can work as much as a little heart desires and they won't take anything away or reduce your Social Security, and then the enhanced age at age 75. Right now it's age 70. So if you can hold on to your Social Security and not begin until age 70 currently under current law, you get an enhancement. It's even a bigger payment, although you didn't get those payments from 67 through age 70. And so I'm wondering if with this required distribution age at 75, if it's just an underlier to say, hey, look, these are appropriate retirement age, and then at some point Social Security. And this is just me thinking. I've, I've read or seen nothing that, that, w- that would suggest this, but those ages now become in, in line with Social Security age. I'm wondering if that's part of this Secure Act 2.0, if it's just a precursor to a change in Social Security. Hey, Phil, I, explain to me how the Roth IRA – can possibly be preferred over the traditional IRA. Here's a circumstance, the hypothetical. If I'm 30 years old and I've got a young family, and let's say I can, I, I'm investing $10,000 a year, that tax-free $10,000 will grow at whatever it grows, you know, it, whatever the, you want, we want to assume the annual rate is 7%, 10%. 10% of, of $10,000 compounded over the next 30 years is a lot more money than the $8,500 compounded if I pay taxes first. So how does the, which would happen in, in the IRA, the Roth IRA, how is the Roth pre- preferable in that circumstance? Well, we would, we would start that equation with saying you, would, you should still put the 10000 away. Uh, so dollar, you would still put the 10000 away. You can't put 10000 in a Roth, but for, for example purpose, in the Roth IRA anyway, you can't a Roth 401k. So at the age of 30, and let's assume you're in a 22% tax bracket. That would be uh, reasonable. That's $2,200 that you would save in, in, in federal taxes if you put it in a traditional 401k or IRA. Um, you would, that is a true statement. However, by the rule of 72s, and you know, we all know what that is, if you have 8% average earnings, it takes you nine years for that to double. That 10000 at the age of 39 has now become 20 at the age of 48, it has now become 40,000. At the age of 57, it has now become 
80,000, and then at the age of 66, it has now become 160,000. So at some point, now that now we're going to assume you're in retirement, that original $10,000 deposit at the age of 30 that you saved $2,200 on when you put it in there, um, if we played that all the way out to retirement age, you got a tax break on 10000 However, at the age of 66, you or someone at some point in your life or theirs is going to owe taxes on 160000 And I don't care what tax rate you're in. You know, there's a perception that in retirement you're in a lower tax bracket. We don't see that happen too often. Uh, you may go from a 24 to a 22. But regardless of the tax bracket that you're in, the taxes on 160 is going to be so much more than the taxes on the 10 that you originally put in when you were 30. So that's the whole concept overall. Now, but I'm not taking it out ten thousand dollars at a or one hundred sixty thousand dollars at a time. No, you're not. But you're still going to pay taxes on it, you or someone else. But if you would have done that on the Roth side, it's never going to get touched. You've already paid that two thousand two hundred, whatever your tax bracket is for now. You've already paid that, and then the earnings grows and comes out tax free as well. We're on the other side, on the traditional side. Not just your original deposit is taxable because you deferred it, but the earnings is also taxable. So the IRS put that in place simply because, and that's why the required distributions are there, is to say, hey, look, we need a stream of income. We let you put this away long ago. It's kind of like the same concept of taking a mortgage out, which most people have to do anyway. We're not saying don't buy a house if you, unless you can pay cash for it. But if you bought a home and you borrowed – 250000 on well, you're going to pay back much, much more than what you would have had you just paid for it up front. That's the same thing with the Roth concept, but you're, but now that 160 and that 160 does not have required distributions attached to it. And even if it did, who cares? It's tax-free, right? But not just for you, but whoever may inherit that, that's going to come out tax-free. Now let's talk about the Secure Act, the inheritance part. If, you, if it's inherited – an inherited Roth, it does have to come out within the 10 years. But who really cares because it's completely and utterly tax-free, right? But on the flip side, if you, if, you, if you play this out, when most people pass away, their children are in their highest ta working tax bracket, in their 50s, by their averages. That's the, the highest tax bracket they're ever going to be in. Mom or dad passes and leaves me a taxable uh, inheritance, like, such as an IRA or a 401k, TSP, whatever it may be. And I've got to get that out of there in 10 years, and uh, on average over 10 years. So I've got to take at least 10% out each year and throw that on top of what I'm already making. So if I'm in a 22, 24, or 30, 32% tax bracket, now I've got to throw this on top of what I, I'm already making. And because we've talked about before, pensions don't exist anymore. It's not uncommon for someone to have millions of dollars inside of a 401k. So if I've got millions of dollars inside of a 401k, IRA, TSP, whatever it may be, that needs to be taxed, and then I pass away, and that goes through to my children, boy, I'm, I'm glad they got it. But my goodness, the taxes are going to have to pay on that. But on the other end of it, if I just would have paid taxes on that when I was the age of 30, nobody would have to worry about that. Phil, before you go, quick question from Eric. Does simple IRA for self-employed now have a Roth IRA option? Boom, boom. It does, Eric. And as that, I'm glad you brought that up because there's so much in this that I wanted to go over. But simple and SEPs, whereas before you didn't have the option, you now do. The hang-up is that most firms are still trying to find a way to open those accounts because they didn't exist. So it's just a just a administrative issue that why they, if you if you want to open one up, but that is now allowed under the IRS. So small employee in, in, or uh, self-employed people can, in small businesses can open up Roth, SEP, or Simple, which of course we're huge fans of. Phil, if you have some time Thursday, maybe we can get into Secure Act 2.0 more. Then check your schedule. If not, we'll wait till next Monday. How do people? All right, shoot me a text and tell me when. And you can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and sit with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. Go Steelers. Go Steelers. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs>